Well, the singers we're going to hear in Acts 1 and 2 of Janacek's The Macropolis Affair are Carita Matila, singing the role of Emilia Marti, <laughs> Alex Prishain, Gustav Belacek, Jan Vacic, Eva Sterbova, Svata Pluksem, Alex Voracek, Jan Jezek, Jerzy Klecker and Ivona Skarova. And here now is Jerzy Bielachlavek to conduct the BBC Symphony Orchestra in The Macropolis Affair by Janacek.
Na 1792. Tisíckrát za odpuštění. Okrad u není, dosud se nevrátil. A rozsudek stojí špatně, jsem ztracen. Nemohu sloužit, nevím. Starý je od rána u soudu. Zatelefonujte tam. Prosím, hned. Haló, doktor Kolenatý. Již odešel, tak děkuju. A rozsudek. Nemohu sloužit, když já si vzpomenu. Že třicet let, třicet let jsme drželi ten proces. A vy hned k nejvyššímu soudu takhle zabít s tohletou památku. Já to chci konečně vyhrát, nebo prohrát, nebo prohrajem-li pak, pak se zastřelíte. Zrovna tak to říkal váš otec. Tak se zastřelil pro dluhy a konto dědictví. Mlčte, prosím vás. Co ti?
Josefa Prusa zemřelého 1827. On už může. Dokonce před stolety. Kováček, to jsi ty věděla. Ach to, ach to. Mohu vám snad něčím jiným poslovit. Vysoké 
Velké hore se prohlásil několikrát, že zboží loupou Herma Grigor si pomezol. Po Česku, že hoří Machovi. Mezi několika generacemi Rusů si kazu rektorů za pomoci doktorů školnatý. A dík této pomoci prohraje to poslední Gregor. A sice náhodou zrovna dnes. Let's go, 
Oh, <laughs> 
Finnish soprano Carita Matila as the soprano Emilia Marti sauntering off stage at the end of Act One of Janáček's opera, The Macropolis Affair. Jerzy Bieloplave conducting the BBC Symphony Orchestra live from the Royal Albert Hall. This is BBC Radio 3, home of the BBC Proms. Well, the other singers we're hearing as Gregor, the tenor Alish Bristein, Dr. Kalanati, who burst back in at the end, Gustav Belacek, along with uh, Baron Prus Svatopluk Sen. Well, in Act Two, we find ourselves on the stage of the Opera House, where Emilia Marti has just given an absolutely stunning performance. And the act will begin with a little dialogue between a stage technician and a cleaning woman, Jerzy Klecker and Ivona Škvarova. And then the plot continues to thicken in the case of Prus versus Gregor. We'll meet the old aristocrat called Hauk, who kisses Emilia and claims that she's an older opera singer that he had an affair with 50 years ago. And we also discover more about the paperwork in Baron Proust's uh, house. Slečna Marty! Je tu pana ředitele. Ale musí sem přijít. Ona má něco v šatně. Dobrá, počkám. To už je pátý čekaní jako na klinice. To mi nejde do hlavy. Jestli taková ženská má taky mužský. O jo, o jo, to jistě jo, kudrno. A sakra, mě to ani nejde do hlavy. Co jste si tak zakoutil? Víš pro tebe to není. Víš pro tebe to není. Nevyhodíme to nikdo. Odpočíš, Jonku, že jsem nešťastná. Hoď. Ne, ne, hoď. Stěj už je dost, já mám teď jiné starosti. Ale Kristo. Vyť ta Marty je pohromná, myslíš má vydále zpívat. Ale pak už všechno přestane, rozumíš? Pak musím dělat jen divadlo.
Idiot, Tak, tak, haupt idiot. Hauk! Já se mi totiž miloval před 50 lety, 1870. Ona byla citánka, říká lidi čula negra, totiž tam dole, Andalusii, jak se blázil celý svět, a jak chytána, jak se blázil celý svět, a jak chytána. Po celý život by to mi radšte rozumět. Já už pak nežil, to byla jen dřímota. Ale co je vám o dávno mrtvé ženě? Mrtvé, to je hlupé. Hlupé, 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 Podepsat Kristýnce vaši fotografii. Pusti,
Stellte mit Schiebe und das Buch. Mate nejaký zvláštní zájem na osobě pana Gregora. Záleží vám puze na tom, aby ten proces vyhrál. Děkuju vám, nechci vyzvídat. Odkud víte, co všecko je v zamčených skříních mého domu? Je to patrně vaše tajemství. Ano. Věděla jste, že tam jsou týsté dopisy. Věděla jste, že tam kusův odkaz dokonce pod pečetí. Věděla jste, tam je ještě něco. Co? Vy jste tam něco našli? Poslyšte, co je to? Nevím. Je to jen zapečetěná obálka. Co víte o té, kterou nazýváte Rianek? Snad víte něco více o té běhně. Nebojte, nepomožte si. Nebojte, nepomožte tak mluvit. Ale drahá slečno, co je vám, co vám záleží, Nějaké pochybné ženě. Před stolety. Jak se na nic? Četl jsem její dopisy. Úžasně vášnivý týp. Vaše mstá. Jsou tam narážky. Na prazdlášky. Nejsem mladík slečno, ale přiznávám se, že nejhorší růje nemá tolik zkušenosti v blízkých věcech, jako ta dívka. Chtěl jste říct si nevěstko? Jak se opravdu jmenovala Elian? Elian Gregor, vždyť to máte v těch dopisech. Pardon, pardon, tam je jenom E-M, nic víc. To samozřejmě znamená Elian Gregor. To může znamenat třeba Emilia Marty, Eugenia Montes, nebo tisíc jiných jmen. Ale spíš Elina Matropoulos řekně zkvěti. Slyšíte mě? Vy jste to věděla? Učila jsem to. Velikostě závědí řeč o jakém si Ferdinandovi narozeném v Loukově 20. listopadu 1816 a v matričním zápise tohle. Nomen infantis Ferdinand Macropulos Torus, ne manželství, otec vynechán, mater Elina Macropulos. To stačí, to stačí. A 
aspoň pokud se nepřihlásí nějaký pak pak. Tak obálka zůstane zavřená a nikdo ji nedostane. Škoda jen, že to není pravda. Zakažte mi mluvit tiše, slyšíte, Emilie, zakažte mi mluvit tiše. Vás miluju, vy se smějete a já vás miluju. Ještě se, jste ke mně zprostá, ale i, ale i to mi dělá dostož. Prozím se vás, ale i to mi dělá dostož. Chtěl bych vás uškrtit, když mě ponižujete. Chtěl bych... Asi vás zabiju, ve vás je nic odporného, se zlá nízka, strašná, bez ty nespíme.
boundaries of life and art are blurring here at the proms tonight. Soprano Carita Matila, a great diva and a wonderful Janacek singer, playing the part of Emilia Marti, also a great de uh, diva, who has all of the men in the Macropolis affair eating out of her hand. That was the end of act two of Janacek's The Macropolis Affair. Jerzy Bielopolavik conducting the BBC Symphony Orchestra and an all Czech cast, many of them making their proms debut tonight. Well, just like at the end of Act 1, the end of Act 2 has us waiting for some more paperwork. This time, a letter, initials E.M. on the front, which Emilia Marti has persuaded Prus to bring her at night in her hotel room. And we'll pick up the rest of the story in about 20 minutes after the interval for Act 3 and the close of tonight's Janacek Prom. But now, during the interval, a chance to find out a bit more about the opera in our Proms Extra event, which was recorded earlier today across the road at Imperial College and presented by Louise Fryer. Hello, I'm talking about Janicek's opera, The Macropolis Case, and I'm joined by two eminent guests, um, Nigel Simeone, who's co-authored a catalogue of Janicek's works, and Professor Jan Smachny, who is an expert on Czech music. Nigel, could you just um, give us a very quick summary of the central premise of this opera? Yes, it's, it's very extraordinary. Imagine yourself being born the daughter of the court alchemist and this court alchemist actually having an elixir that works. So Elena Makropoulos of Greek origin, daughter of uh, the court alchemist, takes this elixir back in the 16th century and by the time we find her, she is 337 years old. And at least in the opera, we'll talk more about this, I'm sure, in a bit, but at least in the opera, the trajectory is essentially from uh, this glorious figure of mystery who has become an opera singer, uh, essentially revealing bit by bit that what she wants more than anything else, desperately by the end, is to die. Um, in other words, the kind of awful burden of immortality is upon her. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, happens, and it's a bit complicated, uh, we'll have the libretto in the program, thank goodness, but, but she's born Elena Macropoulos, and since this, thank goodness, isn't a quiz show, I won't go through all of the different names that she uses, <laughs> but they all have the same initials. So her luggage is always marked E.M., for instance. Uh, and she ends up being Emilia Marti, which is how we know her by the time the opera starts. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Jan, it's called various things. It's translated as the Macropolis Case, the Macropolis Affair. Which do you prefer, and why so much variation? It's really very difficult. Um, Vietz Macropolis means literally the Macropolis thing the Macropolis thingy. Um, as you know, thing can, can take on all kinds of other connotations. Um, it, it seemed to crystallize into the Macropolis case for many years, but that's rather misleading. There is a legal case involved in uh, that, that underpins the plot. Um, and in fact, uh, Emilia Marti, uh, Marti, in a sense, solves a lot of the problems there. But to say it's about the case is, is not really right. It's about uh, Macropolis. It's about the potion. It's about everything related to that. Are there other things that don't translate, or is it kind of very evident to an English audience as long as they've got a translation of the libretto? I, I think the tone of Chapek's original is actually very hard to capture. Um, what would have He was the playwright that... He, he was the playwright on which the opera was based, and I think the kind of audience he was addressing in 1922 Prague would have loved it. Uh, they'd have laughed at the jokes, they'd have laughed at the asides, at socialism, at uh, you know, a, a, a attempting to um, remember uh, aspects of revolution. Uh, they, they would have laughed at all the in-jokes. Uh, Marti, who has lived all these years, she knows Everybody. She's literally seen it all. <laughs> She's yes. seen it all. Um, and I, th I think the quality of that is actually quite hard to translate. And uh, Czech is difficult to translate anyway. You often have to allegorize Czech in order to make it properly comprehensible to an audience. So I think some of the flavor of the comedy uh, is lost. But that's okay, because Jana Czech is turning this into a great personal tragedy. And he was troubled by the central character in the sense that 
She's very, very cold, isn't she? Uh, yes, but he also fell in love with her. Uh, I mean, he says in his letters, even to uh, Camilla, who, of course, he was actually in love with, um, he did, he described her as the icy one, the brrr, um, wonderful letters. But he says, once he starts working on the opera, he says, but you know, I think I'm falling in love with her a little. And by the time he got to the end of the process, uh, he was completely fascinated by her. So I think you're absolutely right. There was a, certainly an element of trouble. And there's, of course, tremendous ambiguity, ambiguity at the end. Um, what exactly does, as it were, he do with her at the end of the opera is a really nice question. Um, does she or doesn't she die uh, is essentially the enigma because it's completely unclear in the uh, state directions what happens. She collapses, which is quite different. Um, but you, you know somehow that Yamachek desperately wants her to be able to get some sort of release. Um, and I think he really, the, the, the kind of utter searing passion of the music in the last act where she, first of all, she gets drunk, but then she sort of uh, sings of this kind of longing for, 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 for some sort of release. Um, uh, it's some of the most uh, powerful music he ever, he ever wrote. And shot through it, there's this marvelously kind of steely quality as well. Um, it's not anything like as emollient a score as something like The Cunning Little Vixen, mm -hmm. which has tremendous, obvious, elegant beauty about it. The, the, this, this one's got a, got a kind of steely edge to the sound. A lot of, for it, it, just in the way he uses the orchestra, it's some actual, for instance, is lots of, lots of uh, string harmonics which, which have a sort of slight gleam to them. Weird instruments like a children's drum, just as she's confessing near the end. The scoring is just these bare open fifths and a children's drum. And one of the conductors of, of, the, of the Prague premiere wrote to him and said, so what all on earth is this children's drum? And he says, you go to a toy shop and buy one. It is a children's drum. It's a toy. And he wanted that weird sort of skeletal sound. Mm -hmm. um, and I think all the way through the opera, right from the beginning, which has got this brutal kind of raw sound in the prelude, uh, there's, there's a sort of slightly, um, oh, I said steely, uh, this uh, glassy quality almost to the sound mm -hmm. that... that, that somehow says something about how he, how he looks upon this character. It's not an easy relationship, as you, as you say. He, he was always one to fall in love with his heroines, and in some ways, Marti is a kind of synthesis of so many of his other great operatic women. She has some of the vulnerability of Katya and Yenufa. She has the authority and, and, and the uh, almost hectoring quality of the Kabanicha from Katya Kabanova. Um, also, I think she has the devil may care of the vixen too, because 337 years old, what have you got to lose? You, you've, you, as Nigel says, seen it all, experienced it all, and you can afford to tell people to go away, I'm not interested in you. And yeah. she's quick-witted, too. Mm, very quick-witted. Yeah, and she had a bit of a habit of falling in love, not only with his heroines, but with <laughs> anybody but his wife, it seems. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I, th I think this is partly because he, he, he was projecting so much of what he felt, the depth of what he felt in these heroines, onto the love of his last ten years, uh, Kamila Stislova. I, I, in many ways, you know, she, she hovers above um, a lot of, a lot of these, these uh, heroines in his later operas. Uh, uh, if that's the case, then it's a fair bet that uh, Emilia Marti at the end of the opera does actually die because he killed off the vixen, um, uh, not something that happens in the original story, and of course Katya jumps into the Volga. Um, so these, these Kamala mm. substitutes are also characters that he feels uh, an urge to, to kill off, not because of some gruesome sort of personality defect, but because, of course, what he's aiming for here is, is uh, fantastically concise operatic tragedies, mm -hmm. um, and they don't have happy endings. That's certainly true. It's of a piece with his other operas from that point of view, and very different from Chapek's original, which has, uh, uh, Marty has the last laugh. She says, ha-ha, the death of immortality, as, as the formula of the Macropolis elixir is burnt before her eyes. So she's up and standing and laughing at the end of the, op uh, at the, end of the play, not the opera. 
He, and the playwright wasn't so keen on giving Janáček the rights to turn it into an opera. Uh, it, it wasn't so much a question of the rights. Uh, I, think, um, I think there are several things going on. I think on the one hand, Trapek didn't really want to engage with this very senior musical figure who would almost certainly turn out to be quite cantankerous and difficult. On the other hand, um, he, I think he genuinely thought the play itself was far too wordy, far too garrulous, garrulous uh, in order to create a frame for Janáček. It's very interesting. His sister worked for the newspaper in Brno that Janacek wrote a lot for, Lido Vinovini. She was working, Chapek's sister was working in the offices. So she knew Janacek quite well. Uh, and I think Jan's absolutely right. She will certainly have given him intelligence about the fact that this guy was, a, you know, a slightly bothersome old, old soul. <laughs> What's lovely is that Janacek intervened pretty seriously in the play. Um, he cut it massively, of course. Um, he also changes the uh, trajectory of it, uh, as Jan said, into, into a kind of blazing tragedy rather than a, a, a slightly wordy comedy. Um, uh, and yet, Chapek, uh, both the occasions that he saw it and said anything to Janacek about it was absolutely thrilled actually, with the end result. I think the thing he was probably most afraid of was being dragged into having to create a libretto for this thing, which was never a, an issue because yeah. Janacek... I, I think that would have been a, a, an awful thing for a playwright to have to make an opera libretto out of their own play with a cantankerous composer. I, I think shot. also for a young playwright who was actually making his way not just... Um, in the then Czechoslovakia, but also with a genuinely European reputation by that stage. He didn't want to be bogged down, I suspect. Edith Evans wanted to play Emilia Marti. Oh. Uh, and and uh, there's a lot said uh, about um, this play actually being a, a, a sort of, uh, not a riposte to, but a sort of a different uh, uh, take on uh, immortality to uh, Shaw's uh, back to back Methuselah. To, back to Methuselah. Yeah. Um, so yes, Chapek was was he was early mid thirties at the time. Thirty two, I yeah. think. Yeah. So he was young, but he'd already done the insect play. Uh, he'd already introduced the word robot to the international language with mm -hmm. Rossum's Universal Robots, which is one of his. Mm -hmm. Uh, earlier and wonderful plays. Um, uh, so, yes, he was very much an international mm. figure. Uh, and I think the idea of being tied to slaving over making a libretto of this play was probably the reason why he made all of these apparent difficulties over rights. But they were all solved very, very quickly in the, in the end. Mm -hmm. and I think his sister probably helped with that. I, I think that was so, but I think also the rights really affected turning it into a, a kind of musical or, or, or some sort of American version, and it didn't really affect it being turned into an opera. Um, There's a wonderful letter from Chapek, actually, where he says, oh, for heaven's sake, I'm sure there won't be any problem if you're just going to turn it into an opera in mm. Czech. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so that kind of brings me on a bit to the history of, of its performance. How was it received when it was first performed? It was pretty successful. I, I mean, Janáček's, uh, the really great big success of his life was premiere in Prague of, of Jenofa uh, in 1916. And, um, you know, th that brought him out of a kind of torpor that he'd been experiencing before. Later operas had some success, some not terribly successful, a certain amount of incomprehension, particularly, I think, where the vixen was concerned. Yes, it, I agree. It's odd, in a way, that whereas the Vixen was extremely slow to attract public affection, um, Macropolis was, by all accounts, much his biggest Prague hit after Yennefer. As Jan says, he'd been sort of lurking in the Moravian shadows until 1916, when Yennefer had its long delayed Prague premiere. Um, but, but the other operas, they were introduced in Prague. They were extremely carefully prepared by a wonderful conductor called Ostrichil. He took tremendous care over them. But Macropolis was the one that really seems to have caught on mm. uh, with, the, with the Prague public. Um, 
which you might find strange because it's quite edgy, it's quite fierce, it's, um, it's certainly got none of the uh, sort of lovable characters or the genuine humour of uh, Vixen, um, or for that matter the sort of, uh, if you like, it sounds terrible to call it conventional tragedy, but the sort of straightforward tragic story of, of, of Katya. It's, it's much more ambiguous than that. But I, I think also for a, a relatively sophisticated audience, as Prague audiences were by 1926, seeing something contemporary, you know, th this is not an opera set in a forest, it's not set in a prison camp or somewhere a along a, a, a Russian river miles and miles away, it, it did have a contemporary We should say it, it is set in a lawyer's office backstage yeah. of the theatre and in a hotel, hotel room. Mm. Uh, so it's all, it, it's all very modern. And I think it's the first, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure, but I think it's the first operatic appearance of a telephone um, hello, Dr. Colinati. Hello, you know. uh, I, I think I, I can't think of any opera before 1926 that has a, 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 mm -hmm. a telephone. It doesn't actually ring, but he picks it. I mean, there isn't a sort of thing in the score saying phone mm -hmm. rings, but, but there is a part for the phone. Um, so uh, yeah, the, mm. the serious point is the one Jan makes, which is that this is quite a modern, contemporary, mm -hmm. urban opera rather than a rustic yeah. idyll. And I, I think this is one of the things that Janáček is so good at evoking. You, you mentioned the overture, which is, is big and it's, it, it's uh, very in your face, uh, and it's suggesting a kind of busy contemporary world, but it's also, uh, it also has two time frames. You have the contemporary world, but you have towards the end of it these offstage trumpets and drums suggesting the world the, the, fr from which uh, Elena Makropoulos comes, um, something remote, late 16th century, uh, exotic from that point of but view. But then combined with combined. the, with the uh, you, you know, Janacek's music is, is mostly made of these little cells, if you like, and Macropolis is a glorious example of watching them evolve. You can hear it actually happening um, without laboring any points at all. Uh, you can hear how these, these little musical cells are evolving into slightly different ones. So the, you know, the intervals, which are mostly fourths and fifths, so there's not much in the way of sort of conventional consoling major chords. There's a lot of slightly angular uh, stuff um, that has a slightly sort of hollow ring to it sometimes. Um, and uh, it's absolutely thrilling the way he just starts right from the beginning generating the highest imaginable voltage with mm -hmm. these uh, with these sort of rushing demi semi quavers in the in the mm -hmm. lower strings and uh, timpani thumping away on off beats. It's incredibly exciting, um, and what's delightful about it is that uh, you know Janáček used to be rather fashionable to say that he never he quite understood how to write for these instruments. It was all it's all very difficult. There's a marvellous little letter that he wrote to the editor of Lidere Novini saying, I'm in Prague at the moment, I'm really enjoying listening to what the orchestra sounds like just before the rehearsal starts, because they're practicing all the hard bits. There's this bit that the trumpets always split, which is in fact the offstage trumpets at the very, very end of the opera. Absolutely marvellous moment. And there's also the bit where the horns take over the uh, string bit at the beginning of the overture and have a fiercely, fiercely difficult bit to play. And you think, well, nobody would have written that and expected it to be played. Well, he knew that it could be played right, but he also knew it was desperately difficult. And he actually took mischievous delight in the fact, uh, wrote letter home about it to this friend of his, uh, saying they're really struggling with this stuff and I love hearing them getting it right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and also, he was continually changing things right up to the first performance. Uh, the, the rehearsals in Bodenov, the conductor said, enough, enough, I'm not having any more of this. And apparently, even after that, uh, Janáček snuck into the archive um, wh where the parts were kept and added another little bit for the cello, which was a big surprise uh, at the premiere. Uh, uh, yes, there are some very, very sweet little letters. And you think, why on earth is he writing a note 
to the second trombone of the, of the as it sounds like the Mikado, doesn't it? <laughs> writing, writing a note to the second trombone of this opera orchestra saying, mm. oh, add half a bar here and do that. And it's exactly, as Jan says, these were these sort of absolutely last minute surprises. Why do you think he was so interested in the idea of immortality? I mean, in Vixen, he gives a kind of life cycle and there's a very positive spin on it. In this one, it's very much the idea of living long is not a good thing. I wonder if it was partly because he was being to feel his own age by then. He was comfortably into his 70s. I, I think he probably, uh, certainly in terms of his relationships with people like Kamala, he, he liked at least to give the illusion that he was going to last forever, but I think he knew he wasn't. So I, I think that's a, that's a lovely question, but mm. it, it's probably at that sort of age that you do start grasping with the mm. fact that we're not all going to last forever. But I think uh, John Tyrrell has pointed out the similarities, oddly enough, between Vixen and, and uh, Macropolis. I mean, they, they're miles apart, you know, the, 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 the kind of rural idyll that uh, surrounds Vixen, this very highly urban environment that surrounds Macropolis. But in essence, it's a celebration of the value of life. Um, life against the eternal cycle of nature in the case of the vixen, but also the realisation that immortality is a pretty hollow uh, thing. It gives you huge experience, but you don't value that experience anymore by the time you come to the end of it. And, and so uh, a normal life, a 70 years life, is, is, is what is being celebrated here. And I think that was Chapek's intention as well. So he wrote to Camilla that um, we're only happy because our lives are ending, going to end, do end. Which is why I think that very ambiguous uh, stage direction on the last page of the score, she collapses, is one that leaves us with something very uh, wonderful to kind of contemplate. Does she or doesn't she finally get the, uh, the release that she's become, as Jan says, absolutely desperate for by the time we get to that, that last scene? It's a nice conundrum. Mm. But while you ponder that question, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there. Thank you so much to my guests, Jans Machny and uh, Nigel Simeone, and thank you too for coming. Thanks. Louise Fryer there presenting today's Proms Extra, which was recorded earlier this afternoon at Imperial College, just across the road from the Royal Albert Hall, where we are tonight for this BBC Prom, The Macropolis Affair by Jan Acek. And don't forget, there's one of those every day, and there's plenty of time to come across the road to the prom itself. So there are full details on the BBC Proms website. BBC Symphony Orchestra making their way back on stage now and the men of the BBC Singers joining them as well for Act 3 of the Macropolis Affair which takes place in a hotel room. Emilia Marti and Baron Cruz emerge from the bedroom where he's given her the letter marked EM in exchange for a night of passion but he remarks that he's found her a very cold lover. The news then comes that his son Yannick has killed himself because he's been so madly in love with Emilia too. Cruz leaves in real distress. Meanwhile, the old aristocrat Hulk reappears and asks Emilia Marti to elope with him. But just as they're about to leave, the lawyer, Dr. Colinati, appears and asks Emilia about a certain forged document. Gregor and Vitek then arrive and start searching her belongings and discover that she actually has many names, all of them beginning with E.M. While they're doing that, Emilia gets drunk and when she comes back in, she blurts out the whole truth. She is, in fact, Elina Macropoulos, she's 337 years old, and her father was Macropoulos the Apothecary, who managed to concoct an elixir of life, as directed by the original Baron Proust back in the 18th century. Proust made Macropoulos give the potion to his daughter to prove that it wasn't poison, and Amelia, poor thing, has been wandering the world ever since, having to reinvent herself every generation, and really losing all meaning to her life. She gives the recipe for the elixir of life to Christina, but Christina burns it, and at the end, Emilia Marti gives up on her life, collapsing to the ground and singing a prayer as she dies. So, what is it like for the Finnish soprano Carita Matila to inhabit this extraordinary character? It starts like a comedy and then ends up being like opera seria, at least uh, what comes to the story and the role itself. It's, it's just hilarious. It's a fabulous role. Singing-wise, it's challenging in a way that it's written like a... It, it's more like a play 
really, like dialogue in operatic terms. I can't compare it with any other role that I have done because it ha has all these elements. Usually I have these tragic roles. I'll either, you know, I always get killed, you know, either kill myself or somebody kills me, or, and it's usually very, very sad and, and, and serious. And uh, this is just, I get to laugh, and although I, I, I die at the end, <laughs> it's um, kind of like, um, like I want it to be like that. You crave for this eternal youth, and it ends up being not such a happy state of uh, living. Um, you know, your, your friends around you, they die, and you never die when you have this portion. It's a wonderful ending to that uh, totally crazy story. Soprano Carita Matila, who sings the part of Emilia Marti in Janacek's The Macropolis Affair, Act 3, about to start with the BBC Symphony Orchestra on stage now with their leader, Stephen Bryant, and the men's chorus from the BBC Singers, their chorus master, Nicholas Chalmers. We'll hear them a little way into the third act. And here now comes Yezhi Bielaflavek to conduct the final act, Act 3, of The Macropolis Affair by Leos Janacek, starring Carita Matila. Oh, my God. 
Thank you. 
So cheese.
the Royal Albert Hall and everyone in it bathed in a sudden flash of white light at the very end of Janacek's opera, The Makropoulos Affair.